anybody out there who has not checked out uh, Locked On Bears, I highly suggested really, really good content, consistent content. And uh, yeah, man, you do a great job. I can't say enough good things about you. So appreciate that. Hey, Lauren, do you think this bye week came at a good time for this team? I mean, I don't. I don't know if it's a bad time, but there are certainly better times to be at. I mean, I, I would have liked to see it a little bit later in the process, you know, maybe right before you get into all those divisional games. But I, I certainly understand, like, you want it after a London trip just to sort of reset and, and connect that way. But I just would have liked the London trip and the bye week to be a little bit later on. But I don't think it's going to have a drastic impact either way on the, the you know, the success of the Bears this season. So they're just going to take it and roll with it. Um, Yeah, for sure. Good timing health wise, because uh one of my friends was talking about how Ryan Bates needs to come back sooner than later. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like earliest he should come back is the bye week brisker coming back. Um, probably a good sign for the defense. And then uh, Kyler Gordon, I don't think we ever, at least I never really noticed or heard anything serious or concrete about his injury. So probably that in that sense, it's good timing. Um, and then this is more of a question for Lauren and I should have done the research on this, but have we, put into consideration like what is Matt Eberflus and this coaching staff's record after a bye week and do they perform well with extra time or are they a team that because there's are some of those coaches in the NFL that you know just notoriously do bad maybe they out overthink or outthink themselves during bye weeks rather than doing well so I don't know how do you guys feel about that for the Bears I don't know how to plan for my expectations for uh, Washington. Yeah, they're one and one in the two bye weeks Matt Eberflus has had. Uh, last year, they beat the Lions coming out of the bye week and, and maybe their best best game of the year, at least the best feeling win of the year, where it felt like they really shut down what Ben Johnson wanted to do offensively. The Bears came out pretty hot offensively. You know, They held Goff under 200 yards and picked him off a couple times. and like It just felt like a good all-around game. And then the year before, the bye week was right before they played the Eagles, and they lost that game, but it was a really good Eagles team. And it felt like the Bears played them surprisingly close through most of that game. Like, you know, it was it was a two score game by the fourth quarter, but like it was tight enough in there where you felt like the Bears didn't belong anywhere near that Eagles team and they were still able to at least hang in there. So, so I come in with some level of confidence that the Bears do take decent advantage of this of this advanced week. And I mean, if Jaden Daniels is going to be out, maybe it won't make a difference either way. But <laughs> at least you can feel a couple of different ways you could be confident this week. I was considering that as like a Matt Eberflus schematic thing issue wise. Uh, the only other famous bye week was the mini buy, right? Like two years ago with Justin Fields and extra time, I guess does serve this coaching staff. Well, so I was just kind of curious timing wise, I guess this is a good matchup to have an extra bye week. This is a pretty big deal, honestly, in the grand scheme of playoff pictures. I can't believe we're even like talking about that this early, but you beat the commanders. It's a pretty, uh, pretty necessary, very important win. You maintain your seventh spot in the standings right now because you are the seventh seed and in the playoff, uh, if the playoff started today, which is always like a funny thing to say, but I guess it is like a big game. So in that, in that sense. And it is worth noting, you know, different offensive and defensive coordinator in the last two bye weeks. So you never know that if that's purely an Eberflus thing that'll carry over or if we'll see how, how Waldron and Eric Washington do that the same or differently than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, I was going to say you have to use that term staff very loosely. You know, one of the things from this bye week that I took away was actually just watching some of the other teams. Like if you caught the Vikings and Detroit game, mm. man, was that was that a fight to the end? And then just watching the Chiefs again and just being reminded of how good they are and looking at our division, and that's the title of the show tonight, the NFC North is tough. I mean, we talked about it last week how – isn't it so damning that we finally take the steps forward? We finally figure some things out, feel good about ourselves. We're four and two, yet somehow we're fourth in a division. It, it, like, what are the odds, you know? Yeah, it's it's one of those things where we'll, we'll kind of see how that plays out over the course of the year, right? Because, you know, Minnesota is starting to show a little bit of warts there with Detroit kind of finishing that one out on top and that maybe – you know, certainly Minnesota is very good. Not that these are none of these are bad teams, but maybe they're not as invincible as we thought they would. And the Bears last year played Detroit really tight in both games, beat them once and probably should have beat them in the other game as well. And then I think of those three teams, Green Bay is probably the worst of the three right now. And you feel like the Bears have closed that gap quite a bit. And depending on whether you get the superhero Jordan Love or the supervillain Jordan Love, he seems to have big plays in, in the positive and negative in every game. Like I, I do feel like the Bears can still be right there with any of those three teams, but there's still a lot of 
a lot the Bears have to prove, right? Like we haven't seen them consistently do it, even when we feel like they're close. So it still feels to be like those are winnable games, but I, I'm not. They're not going to earn the benefit of the doubt just yet. How do you feel? Uh, what the Bears have demonstrated so far kind of stacks up with this NFC North. You kind of walked us through that, but do you feel like this is a team that is stacking up quite close? Are they like 85% there with these teams or are they full on a year away? Yeah, I, I think they're pretty darn close to Green Bay at, at this point, just because I, I still see Green Bay as a, a younger team that's still a little volatile. That they can they can have the great defensive performance against CJ Stroud, but then you know early on in the year they had some more difficult issues trying to slow down opposing defenses, so I, opposing offenses. So I'm not like I'm not sold on the Packers being super steady every single week. I mean they're five and two, they're, they're a good team, but I'm not sold on them being like so much head and shoulders above of where the bears are right now. I, I do think the Vikings and lions feel a, a, a step ahead where, you know, over the course of the season, I think they're going to be, the, the, those two teams are better teams than the bears right now, but in any one week sample matchup, like especially the, against the lions, I feel like that's a game that the bears could steal one. Or, I mean, I mean, heaven forbid, maybe two in that one. Whereas like Minnesota scares me a little bit more just in terms of like Brian Flores being able to get so aggressive against this offense and against Caleb Williams and maybe, throw some things at him that a lot of other teams won't. And like, I, th I think Caleb can handle the lions as a matchup a little bit easier than what the Vikings present. Even though I think the lions are probably the overall better team as a whole. I just think the coaching wise and scheme wise, he can handle Detroit a little bit better than, than what Minnesota is really going to go all out aggressive on you, which in those kind of games, it's super volatile. Anything can happen. Yeah. One thing's for sure that if we are going to sit there and keep up with either of the, or e any three of those teams, um, we're going to have to bring our a, a game to the table and they're going to be fun matchups regardless, which makes the end of the season very exciting. I mean, I can't wait to play some of these divisional games and exactly see where the bears stand compared to the rest of the NFC North, because just like you said, I think, I think we're capable any given Sunday. Like we have the shot. I wouldn't feel so great about it as to give them the benefit of the doubt yet. I mean, you, you said it perfectly, but, um, but we're we're there, or if not, we're at least knocking on the door. And if we are just, you know, a step ahead of where we should be, oh man, will those be really fun games to watch yeah, and, and see? And I think that the fun thing about that too is that we'll know, like, because the NFC North is so good this season that when the Bears get through that stretch where it's, you know, Lions, Vikings, Packers, 49ers, Vikings, Lions again, some some order in that, we'll know by the end of that if this Bears team can actually make some noise in the playoffs or maybe just how far away they are. Like we're not going to, we're not going to go in the end of the year wondering, Hey, is this team, is this team actually any good or not? Like we will find out pretty quickly where they match up in the pecking order there. And it'll give us some clarity heading into the end of the season. And then the potential of the postseason question. I think for me, this is why I want Jaden Daniels to play next week so badly. Cause I, I I'm kind of, in favor of the Bears getting favorability and, and luck with injuries and schedule and all that stuff. And I think so far it's been absolutely perfect. And I think as the next few weeks go on, I think it's even lining up even better in luck with them. But I'm kind of sick of hearing about the Bears. Well, they should have beaten these guys. They should have beaten these guys. They should have, you know, oh, they, they barely beat one in five teams. And, you know, when you look at even play teams like Washington, Washington's every single opponent is either one in five or a one in six now and or two in five. Um, go back and look at Houston's record. Houston is beating up on bottom feeders and they're, you know, competing with one or two teams here and there. They are competing with those guys, but at the end of the day, they're still losing. Um, so that's why I kind of really want Jaden Daniels to play because at the very least you find out, I don't, I don't really care so much about this rookie race, this rookie of the year race. Um, doesn't really interest me. I think I like both players, both players can be good. Uh, but I'm just, I'm really hoping Jaden Daniels is healthy just so we can actually see or kind of start to uh, sift through how actually good the Bears are. Because if they beat Washington, I think the perception changes pretty dramatically. Yeah, I, I also feel like t people who want to paint that narrative for the Bears can find it in Washington too, though, that like, okay, yeah, they're, they have more wins. But I mean, prior to the Panthers game last week where they crushed them, but prior to that game, their defense was ranked like 20th, I think, in like yards and points. So you could say again, like, well, okay, Caleb Williams had another big game against another bad defense. Even though it was a better team that the Bears beat, it was still a quote-unquote bad defense, which I still think is not a, a super strong argument either way. But you, you can always find 
holes to poke. I don't think we're going to get, I don't think we're going to see the bears earn much of that, like contender versus pretender respect until it's Packers, Vikings, Lions. Cause then you still got the Cardinals and the Patriots between then. And uh, even a win of Washington, like will help a lot. It'll be the, the most help they've had all year, but people are still going to want to doubt until, until they see the, how they stack up with the rest of the division. It does feel very personal, maybe just as bears fans, but it does feel like that narrative is always kind of particularly painted about the bears and, I guess there, I could see it from a national perspective too, but at the same time, there's plenty of teams that in my mind, I'm like, I could poke holes in these teams as well. And so I don't know, maybe it just feels like we're being personally attacked because it's our team. But um, that's why I think like a Washington victory against a full healthy team is going to be a little bit better than if you play Mariota and you smoke Mariota, that's going to be the first thing everyone says is, hey, it's Mariota. What did you think was going to happen? Blah, 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 blah. So I think it comes back to some of that benefit of the doubt stuff though, right? It's like every time... Every time in the past that we thought the Bears might be getting good, they would disappoint. So I, I I don't I understand why you know nationally people say, oh the Bears are playing well, but like we don't trust them yet because it's kind of been a fool me once, shame on me thing. Fool me every year for the last decade, shame on you. You know? Yeah, you're you're completely right with that. That you have to earn it. You have to earn that benefit of the doubt, and we just we haven't yet. History has not dictated us getting that kind of respect, and that's why we don't. So um, that could change. But you got to go out there and change it. And I know we've preached change a lot. I've heard Ryan Poles say it over and over and um, change in time, right? Like we got to change this thing, but we got to change it the right way. And so for me, it's really big to go out there and, you know, it, I'm very hopeful that we could sweep the Packers this year. I would be so thrilled with getting two wins against them because for me, that's a statement and it's a sign of change. It's something that we haven't been able to do. So I don't even want just one win. I want them both. And yeah, I, I think it's things like that that really matter for me this season, those type of statements. It feels to me like I'd be happy starting with one because I mean, how many years has it been since they've beaten Green Bay head head? I was just pulling up the record. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it's five years, it's 10 eight. games in a row. It was, the, yeah, it, was the, it was the end of the 2018 year with Matt Nagy was the last time the, the Packers lost to the Bears. So I'll take one. Two would be great, but I, just one even would represent progress and change, especially when I think Packers fans are feeling very, very confident about where they are too. And it's kind of that rare time where maybe you could knock them down a few pegs with it as well. Trade deadline's coming up. And for the last two years, the Bears have traded a second round pick away at the deadline, once for Chase Claypool, once for Montez Sweat. We traded Roquan Smith away right at the deadline. So we've been busy right at the deadline historically in the last two years with Ryan Poles. I'm not so convinced that we'll be in it as much uh, value-wise this year. I don't think we're getting rid of any high picks or anything like that. But I asked the question on our channel, like, should the Bears make a move at the trade deadline? And the four options I gave everybody was, yes, add defensive line. Yes, add offensive line. Yes, trade somebody away. Or no, and just stay put. And to my surprise, um, 51% of the people voted to add offensive line. And I think that is still a big concern for this team, depth-wise. But I don't think you're finding any quality offensive linemen out there at the trade deadline. But I'm just going to shoot the question right your way as well. Should the Bears make a move at the trade deadline? Yeah, I, I think I'm in the same page you are there, where if somehow there was some team that was willing to trade away a quality starting offensive lineman at the deadline, I would certainly call and, and find out what that's worth. But you just don't see good off like if, if a team has a good offensive lineman they don't really have much incentive at all to trade them unless they're old or expensive and i don't think the bears really want an old or expensive offensive lineman like it, it they could trade for somebody like nate davis but that you already have a nate davis at home that you don't want anyway so it's to me it just doesn't feel like there's the right fit there where it's like yeah but no other team is going to want to give up a good young offensive lineman you could get like a, an older guy like Brandon Scherf from the Jacksonville Jaguars, who's very expensive and and they're a bad team anyway. And but he's also like thirty three, so it's really just kind of a one year thing. And and I think that's what I come back to for the Bears here. It's like any trade you would make at the deadline this year is not about making the team better for twenty twenty four. Like if you make a trade, it's about making the team better for twenty twenty five, twenty six, and twenty seven. Like it's a, like like Montez Sweat wasn't about winning more games last year all that much. It was about giving you a pass rush for the next five years. And so unless there's that kind of player available, which I don't think Miles Garrett's not going to be available. Max Crosby's not going to be available. Micah Parsons not going to be available. The pipe dream guys are not going to be available. And I don't think the bears are going to pull the trigger on a big, big splash like that. So 
I, I see the Bears more keeping it quiet. And if anything, they trade away Nate Davis or Khalil Herbert or Valus Jones, like just to get something for a player you're not using anyway. But I think it's going to be relatively quiet compared to previous years. Yeah, David, I know you always talk about in terms of trades. Um, are you taking a step back? Are you taking a step forward? Or are you just taking a step sideways? And I think you know, if you're going to go off and target some offensive linemen and get rid of Nate Davis in the same process, you might just be taking a step sideways rather than forward, right? So I don't know, David, what do you think, though? Should the Bears make a move at the trade deadline at all? Um, I don't know yet, and that's kind of where I'm standing with the Bears because luckily the trade deadline, I think, is November 8th, if not, I'm not mistaken, or November 9th, I, I want to say. it's or something, yeah. It's after, like that, but we basically after get to do... our matchup on the third. It's like two yeah, days after so that. Exactly. So we do get to see a little bit more football from the Bears, and I think kind of what we've been – Hinting towards even that uh, that stink on the Bears or not being sure, or proving that they're consistent. If they're six and two at the trade deadline, I think you become buyers rather than sellers. And I think, uh, like we were talking about at the beginning, watching these teams uh, during the bye week, and you kind of see what the bad teams are and what their position of values are, and are they are they becoming quick sellers and you know doing a full rebuild and. I was kind of surprised, Lauren, that you said that Max Crosby, Miles Garrett, those guys are not going to be available. I could see the Micah Parsons one. I could see them being available. I just don't think that it's at a price that the Bears would be willing to pay or want to pay or would be worth paying. But I could see a team like Detroit, who's in full-on win-now mode, if they need to give up a first and a second for Miles Garrett and Cleveland needs to recoup some of those losses from Deshaun Watson or something like that. I could see it happening. I wouldn't be shocked by it. Um, but I guess, you know, you know, you would know better for sure than I would. I just think it's unrealistic. Yeah. But it's, is it impossible? Probably not. I think teams like Detroit or, you know, uh, Kansas city who are ready to go, I think are more likely to invest in that with the bears. Like Polly said, I just don't think any one of these moves is going to be a step forward considerably for this season. Um, even if you do get an offensive lineman in the middle of the season, that they, those guys take long times to gel. It's not necessarily an upgrade physically. All these guys are six foot five, 350 pounds. It comes down to coaching technique and how they gel with the rest of those teammates. So training for a guy like that could not, or could be necessarily like not a great step forward. And then you're not really uh, lining yourself up for something positive in the future. Because like you said, they're going to be expensive. They're going to be old. And at that point, I'd rather keep the 38th pick in the draft for a left guard. So my short answer is not yet with a possibility of I'm leaning towards 80-20. Don't make any moves this year. Uh, I just want to really quickly answer, Naj, who would want Vilas? I think the animal cruelty shelter needs somebody to rehab their <laughs> ferrets. And I think that's going to be about the only person interested. I don't well, know who out there would be interested in Vilas. What do you think, Lauren? Well, do you remember in, during Hard Knocks, right during Raster Cutdown Day, Ryan Pohl said they got a trade offer for Bayless Jones. Oh, and fifth. Yeah, and it wasn't – obviously it wasn't enough for them then, but we don't know what team that was, but I, I'd call back that team and say, hey, we'd take a seventh. I mean, just take anything. <laughs> it's, you're you're going to cut him eventually. You might as well get whatever draft pick they'd give you. So at least at least one team had interest in Bayless Jones a month and a half ago. So maybe even at a lower price, they could still have some interest in him. If, he, if he's just going to sit on the bench as a healthy scratch anyway – why not get something for him? Well, I definitely wouldn't give him any more opportunities here on this team. I think he's exhausted all those. So that's all that's left for him is sitting on the bench. Um, what other players do you think might be targets to shop around to other teams? Well, we've seen uh, Ian Rappaport and others have mentioned Khalil Herbert as someone who the Bears have gotten calls about. Apparently the Vikings had called about Herbert before they traded for Cam Akers, who they've, who's been on that team before. But the Bears kind of said, yeah, we're not going to send Khalil Herbert to a division rival. And, and I do find myself feeling like Herbert's almost more value. I mean, I get wanting to get something for him on, at the end of his rookie contract. He'll be a free agent this summer. I don't think they're going to resign him because they, they have DeAndre Swift and Roshan Johnson ahead of him. So why not get something for him now at the deadline? I get that. But I also feel like if, heaven forbid, DeAndre Swift gets injured or Roshan Johnson gets injured, like Herbert's a really good running back, and it would be nice to have that insurance policy option there. Like, is it worth if, – if you give up for a six-round – would you have a six-round pick for him or have him just in case of injury because he could still be a guy that can get you four or five yards of carry. We, we've seen him be a really good running back in a rotation. He just kind of fell out of this rotation, but he could still be a good player for you in a pinch if you need him. And I feel like I'd rather have that than a six-round pick, but – I don't know if you could get a fifth and or a fifth and a seventh or something. Maybe you can start to talk me out of it, but it's Herbert. It's Nate Davis. It's Valus Jones. It's really just 
the players you're not using that you don't even really see being around next season that you might as well get something for if you're going to lose them anyway. I mean, last year, this team was pretty injured at the running back position. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I believe we had four guys go down. So I'd be frankly shocked that Nate Davis could even get you much value. Even, you know, I would argue that clear Herbert at this point is probably more of a value, um, even though running backs just don't get traded for much. I'm with Lauren 100 percent on that one. And I even even at the beginning of the year, I didn't want even to entertain the idea that Cleo Herbert was getting cut. I thought that was an insane story from the very beginning, because like you said, it's what are, what are you going to do? You're going to have a six round pick and then you got to go sign a guy off the streets at, in week eight or nine when your running back core is depleted. We went through, I think, six running backs last year. There was a point where Kerry Blasing game was one of the two running backs on the roster with Darrington Evans because everybody went down with injury um, for like a two week stretch. And that was pretty, pretty bad. So that um, I would keep and let him ride it out. I don't think you're getting much value out of a six round pick anyway. Maybe you, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is better to have Darrington Evans and a six round pick, get him off the street. Um, no. You know, that's, didn't that's we kind draft of the future. Didn't, that we we can't predict, Herbert? But... didn't we draft Herbert in the six? I think he's either the fourth I think or, it was or the fifth, fifth, if I'm not mistaken. He's six. He's a fifth. Oh, no, he's a six round pick. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you can, if you could come out even after getting, you know, usage out of him for four years, that might not be the worst thing, but uh, let me throw an oddball at you guys. What if somebody calls you out about Tevin? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm moving anybody on this offensive line other than Nate Davis. Like the, the, you need, you need the depth here. It, it, even with, even though Tevin has an injury history or whatever, and he's, he's on the last year of his contract, but I, I just don't think there's any room to budge on the offensive line with anybody not named Nate Davis at this point. No, I think Lauren's got it nailed down and Nate Davis, I'd be shot. I'd just be more interested than anything for what his value would be if teams are actually calling and what are they calling for? I'd love to be a fly on the wall for that. It's probably a fifth, sixth or a seventh. I can't imagine anything higher than that. And at that point, the amount of money you're paying for him. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could clear the, that off the books, but I don't know if that's worth it even for losing him for depth because he's a pretty decent depth starter, I would suppose, than a guy off the street. Agreed. Well, so I'm a firm believer in your defensive line can never be good enough. And, you know, I like what David said about how he's not sure yet where our position is coming up to the trade deadline because these next two weeks could really impact that. If you do rattle off two more wins and you are six and two, there's going to be a real kind of need to almost add to this team because you know the window in the nfl when it opens it sometimes doesn't stay very open for long so you got to take advantage of every opportunity you get whenever that opportunity presents itself so um as far as the defensive line if we were to add somebody to the defensive line we talked about you know mike parsons max crosby um miles garrett not being very realistic candidates do you have somebody else out there any other names that maybe aren't you know top tier starter guys but can still add to the depth of this rotation and still make an impact on this team there's not a lot that jumps to mind i mean maybe like trey hendrickson from the cincinnati Bengals, but i, I think the Bengals are always going to feel like they're still a contender as long as they've got joe burrow but you know after another if they, if they lose a couple more games they're three and four right now and seem to be figuring some things out but if they if we get closer to the trade deadline and they're three and six i mean even then they probably still say hey they can go on a run and come back and not trade one of their top pass rushers i mean it's it's kind of like the offensive line question it's like okay is is there a team with a really good young pass rusher that they're gonna just want to give up all of a sudden i mean the commanders did it with with montez sweat so never say never P people have pointed out like trayvon walker from the jacksonville jaguars although again i think good teams want to keep their young players especially when they're already under contract for a few more years so I, I, if I'm the Bears, I, I'd look more to add on the interior anyway for some more depth there and, and not necessarily take more snaps away from guys like Austin Booker and Daryl Taylor who you, you want to see develop and grow too. Yeah, David, this was slow pitched your way for your Cameron Jordan take. Just, just lobbing no. it to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Lord, I've literally since week, I don't know, preseason week one, I have been obsessed with the idea of, uh, yeah, thank you for that lollipop, fat, slow pitch softball. I want Cameron Jordan so badly on this team, and I think he fits in absolutely perfectly. Um, he is one of those older guys on an expiring contract. I don't think it would take much to get him. I think he's like a fifth round pick probably at this point. The Saints are in an absolute catastrophic cap situation right now. Um, they need to clear the books as fast as humanly possible. And that's why I think like 
thankfully these two weeks additionally um, kind of dictate where the Saints are going to be and where the Bears are going to be. And I think Cam Jordan's like the perfect fit for this team, the perfect fit for the scheme itself as well, because like you said, I don't necessarily want to take away snaps from like Austin Booker. I think Darrell Taylor has been playing out of his mind. Even Chris Williams kind of flashes every once in a while. But what Cameron Jordan has been talking about, and I've just been following the Saints in the offseason because I've just been obsessed with the idea of Cam Jordan on the Bears. Cam Jordan lost like 20 pounds so that he could slide inside and play three tech and play outside defensive end. So he's basically just like a souped up Demarcus Walker in the role that we have him playing here. Um, so I've uh, that's my favorite like kind of go to. And I, I again, I don't think Cam Jordan is going to cost you a lot. It's fourth, I think, at most. He's 34 years old. He's pretty expensive. And the Saints are probably just going to look to dump him as soon as they're kind of dead set on where their team is headed because that is a absolute, I think, rebuild team. We talk about these rebuild teams and where these teams are at. I think the Saints are my number one on a full-on, like, complete rebuild. So um, I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but that's kind of my my dream scenario. Yeah, I, I'm on board with any, any trade for a, a lineman on either side of the ball that, like, costs you a fifth-round pick or less, right? Like, I think the fear for me is giving up a first or a second or maybe even a third for a guy that – is more of a short-term option there. I, I just feel like the, the Bears need those first and second round picks to just keep restocking the roster with young players on rookie contracts to develop and grow and keep building that foundation around Caleb. But yeah, a fifth-round pick for even an aging pass rusher like Cameron Jordan that you feel like even if it's just a one-year rental can give you a little bit of a boost without really mortgaging much of your future, I'm definitely in favor of that. And you look at a team like San Francisco, right, with all the injuries they've had around Brock Purdy. Like, they've had the... They've had the financial freedom because of the chief quarterbacks there, and they've had a, a presumably well-talented, well-coached team. But even a team like that, it just takes the right couple of dominoes to fall incorrectly. And not that they're, you know, a broken team that's totally out of it by any means, but not the juggernaut that we thought they once were. And we're still kind of waiting for that to figure itself out. But there's some legit long-term questions there now without McCaffrey probably for the whole season and without uh, Brandon Ayuk gets, has the big injury. Like, they're missing some key pieces, and they don't – they don't seem to have a lot of answers right now. Did you see uh, Kyle Shanahan? There was a report on there. I, I have to check on its legitimacy still, but uh, I saw one where he spent like five minutes just kind of like lecturing Brock Purdy. Yeah. And, I heard it, Brock and like the, the title was like the 49ers are about to implode, like because Brock Purdy was having none of it. And David, uh, I'm to toss this your way because I know this is a nice little fantasy for you. This is my wet dream, Lauren, uh, is that like, uh, you know, you heard these little reports coming in from the beginning of the season where the ownership group in San Francisco, I'm going to glitch again, aren't I? Um, that the ownership group in San Francisco has been kind of uh, disillusioned with uh, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan. And there was that graphic. I remember week one where it showed the the payment structure of the 49ers as a team. And it was just like left tackle first tight end first. Uh middle linebacker first. And it was just one of the most expensive rosters. One of the most expensive. My, my biggest fantasy is I keep kind of fingers crossed watching this 49ers team collapse and I want them to implode. I want the ownership group to get frustrated with uh, Kyle Shanahan. And I think that regardless of how well Matt Eberflus does, let's say Matt Eberflus chugs out like nine to 10 wins and takes your, takes you to the playoffs. If a guy like Kyle Shanahan's available, you write a blank check, you fire whoever's there. And uh, yeah, uh, that would be one of the great, I think the, the opportunity of the bears is a great situation. I think probably one of the most appealing young jobs in the NFL, if it was an available job. And yeah, that's my like absolute, I kind of, it's my fingers crossed hoping for the downfall of the 49ers just so that we have an opportunity at Kyle Shanahan. It's a big, big hope because this job won't be available. I mean, it's just probably won't. Th that and, San Francisco is not going to let him go after one. I mean, they were in the Super Bowl last year. You know, what one year later, it's going to take a couple of years of downfall for him. So it would take a couple of years of Eberflus being disappointing. But I, I think I'm there. I think I'm there with you, Paul. That I, I don't think Eberflus is getting fired. If they were going to fire Eberflus, they would have done it last year. And I think now they've got him on. He's got a couple of years of a leash right now, unless things just some do some kind of crazy implosion. And I don't think the 49ers are also, are also having nearly enough of an implosion just yet. But you know, maybe the seeds of doubt have been planted there that. This could be the beginning of the unraveling, but it's worth noting they still rank top ten in offense and I think top fifteen in defense. So they're not they're not bottom of the NFL by any means just yet, and they're they're holding on by a thread. There was I didn't a, listen to any of you guys David. say any of that. I didn't listen to either of you guys <laughs> yeah, say any. It was just, just in his fantasy just, world. Just tuned out for about 
three minutes and just kind of what? Yeah. what we're getting Kyle Shanahan next year. Yeah, no. the real, um, the real <laughs> pipe there, Dave is that uh, how about this? The, the 49ers fire Kyle Shanahan and the bears replace Shane Waldron with Kyle Shanahan. So Shanahan is just your offensive coordinator. And then you get the best of both worlds. You know, it's, it's, it's oh. funny. This is part of David's oh, dream. Is Lauren. that Eberflus actually steps down to defensive coordinator. Ah. With Kyle Shanahan be the head coach. So it, it's you. part of that whole, you know, insane little thing he's got <laughs> going on. So it's nice though. It's cute. I like it. It gives me, gives me some long-term hope, <laughs> but, um, um that or uh, Kevin Stefanski, even honestly taking an OC job. Yeah, that would be absolutely. pretty sick. Sign me up. Yeah, that would be that would be something I'd be definitely interested in, and I think that's a lot more realistic than the 49ers situation, especially with what they got going on in Cleveland. I mean, it's it's so bad. And, They're both um, equally realistic, Paul. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. Both equally no, realistic. I think kind of talking about the coaching though, and then and that that's kind of been my biggest bugaboo with this team so far and and that combined with the idea of win now mode with this team i think this year of the nfl and we talked about like taking a step back and watching is my god does good coaching like just make so much of a difference early on and what that is and we talk about like making splashes in free agency and making splashes in the draft and all that i don't think and i think this is my personal opinion i probably need to watch the NFL for one more year to really solidify this opinion. Um, I'm super sick of sitting on coaches, giving them more chances and hoping that they become better when you know a better options out there. So when we talk about like, you know, trading for a big piece or what are we doing with this or that? I think a good upgrade at a coaching staff here, especially in Chicago, because I don't think, and Paulie's posed this question before, we're probably the worst coaching staff in the NFC North at this point in the division that any one of these four teams is tops of the division anywhere else in the NFC. And so it's such a glaring weakness, I think, on this team that if you upgraded, let's just be more realistic because I'm I am being silly with the pipe dream. It's just a, a fun fantasy. But like a guy like Kevin Stefanski is very much on the table being available um, even a guy like if Cincinnati implodes, a guy like Zach Taylor, Zach Taylor's coaching tree is not that good, but he does have, you know, good offensive coordinator skills guys like from the Bengals or somebody again, even, um, you know, and we talk about these offensive coordinators, they do get some flash in the pan conversations, guys like, uh, Kubiak or, uh, I forget the name from the guy with the yeah, Texans, but David, like, I don't think you replace a coordinator without replacing a head coach this time around. I don't think, I think you're tied to Shane, Shane Waldron. I just. I, I do agree with you in the theory and how you have been conditioned as a Bears fan, but I think in the sense of what that does to your increased wins, I think an elite offensive coordinator increases your wins by one, one and a half, maybe even two wins per season. And I think when you talk about like adding players and how much wins they, you know, war, like uh, if you're a baseball fan, Lauren, like wins above replacement, I think the glaring, just like throbbing issue with this team where you can add wins above replacement is coaching. And so I don't know how you feel about that. And in the sense of like the realism, yes, I get where you guys are going with this. And that's not realistic to just dump Shane Waldron one year out. But did he, if he's not doing something that is really obvious, if you do break eight and eight or uh, what, nine and eight now, or eight and nine, I think that glaring upgrade can't be ignored anymore. The same way if you do have a good defensive end, but Micah Parsons wants to join your team, you're just going to say, well, hey, it's Micah. He's clearly better. We just got to upgrade. That's such an easier pill to swallow. And that's something that, you know, again, watching the NFL this season, I think a lot of these teams made such, such terrible mistakes when you go down the line. Dallas should have gotten rid of Mike McCarthy. Uh, Las Vegas should not have kept Antonio Pierce. Uh, a lot of these teams that, we're just going to give them one more chance, one more year. And we're not going to do this, this uh, disrespectful firing. And I, I think it ends up biting you in the ass. And so I think the bears shouldn't fall into that trap, but I, I haven't fully thought this theory through yet. Yeah. The, the one thing I'll say about like coach development is that I, I, I always just want to like, feel like I'm seeing signs of like, are they trying different things or are they just, stubbornly stuck in trying to do the same thing the same way they've always done it over and over again because trust me i'm the coach i've been doing it this way for 20 years and it's worked for 20 years so i'm going to keep doing it this way and and i i at least give Eberpus and waldron credit for 
over the course of this season and in the Iberflus case last season, breaking from their traditional tendencies that we've seen them be previously as coaches. Iberflus has changed up a lot schematically. As coverage-wise, they're running a lot different now than they did when he first got to Chicago. They're blitzing more. That he he has he has he has had the self awareness to change things defensively. That tell me he's a guy who can adapt and grow. And we've seen Shane Waldron. Well, it's not completely different from what he did in Seattle. Like even just this season, they've changed their run scheme entirely. They've shifted how they're using personnel quite a bit. Gerald Everett like never plays anymore after being a huge featured weapon in Week One. And like yeah, it was concerning that they they got so much wrong early on that they needed to adjust. But the fact that they've been willing to adjust it and not just stubbornly saying this is what we're going to be gives me some lets me give them some benefit of the doubt that maybe they will keep getting better as coaches. But if as soon as that stops, that's when the that's when the doubt and the and that's when I'm more on your board with you where it's like, okay, this guy's not even trying to be different or better. Let's move on to something else. And I I agree with you as well because the Eberflus shift especially after Alan Williams left and he just saw what was working and what wasn't. And that was an incredibly quick switch. I think the one thing that me and Paul have noticed about the bears, even under Ryan Poles regime, they kind of don't own, they do own their mistakes. Usually it's about 30% too late, right? Moving on from Claypool, moving on from Valus Jones, moving on from Matt Eberflus, moving on from Luke Getze. Move it. I, but I at least the they Luke do Getze it. Issue. But at least they, they do, do it. They do. But with a coaching change, the issue is is you don't do these midseason. You never do them midseason. You can't get these guys midseason. You don't fire. Uh, let's say Stefanski gets fired next week with the Browns. You don't bring him in mid year. No one's going to do that because it's just unrealistic. So these are wholesale changes that you always do have to make. So it's not quick upgrades. They're not that. They are long term thought out changes that you have to make. And if you don't make them. You do have to sit on them for 16 months. They they don't you can't just bail on them. They are a 16 month wrong decision as opposed to a player where you can cut them, replace them, start a new guy, and maybe there's a little bit of an upgrade there. And that's kind of my issue is I don't want to see the traditional Bears thing where we hold on to guys because they're nice guys. And I I I've, I've visualized the meeting with Matt Eberflus as to why he was even given this team and this opportunity this year is because Matt you you were here through the dark days. And you did a good job for us through those. So we're going to give you, you've earned that opportunity to have a chance with a better roster and a better chance to win. And here's you to pick another coordinator and this and that. Me and Polly have always looked at the NFL incredibly cold. It's a business. It's a hardcore business. It's a cutthroat business. And if there is a upgrade to be made, you should, and you have the obligation to make it. And that's why, yeah, while Shane Waldron, does look like he's making changes and they are relatively quick. I think we're just also desensitized to it with seeing Luke Getzey for two, two goddamn years and the changes that he was not able to make or Matty, uh, Matt Nagy and the bubble screen changes he was not able to make over two years. And we're just kind of conditioned to that. But yes, while he's done a decent job, what is this team's identity still? Do we have yeah. one? Do, do, do you feel good? Would you not feel significantly better with what the identity would be under a guy like Jim Harbaugh, under a guy like Kyle Shanahan. I know the moment that season starts, what we're going to be good at and what we're not going to be good at before the games have even been played because of who the coaches are. And in this case, I don't know if we're good week to week. And just to piggyback off that a little bit, um, I think me and David have always kept in consideration that the worst spot to be is stuck in the middle. Right. And right now the middle looks really good for us because we haven't been anywhere near it. So it, it's on one hand, you want to be happy from the success. On the other hand, like I said, you take a look at the landscape of the entire league and you know exactly what it takes to go out there and, and try and win one, especially from the NFC side. And um, I'll tell you right now, it's only been Matt Stafford that's done it recently. And he only did it because the Bengals knocked the Chiefs out. And and so it's it's going to take a lot, a lot to go out there and get the job done all the way. And that includes the best coaches, great talent, and a damn good quarterback. Game prediction and, you know, walk us through your thoughts on Washington. And let's let's say it's with Jaden Daniels. How do you expect this team has been flowing? And what do you expect to see against Washington if you care to share that yet? Yeah, I, I think, I didn't say, I think either way, whether it's Jaden or Marcus Mariota, I still think the Bears are going to win that game because I, I think Iberflus can stay a step ahead of 
Cliff Kingsbury scheme. And I, I think this will be the best defense that the, that Jaden Daniels and the company have played all season. And that Cliff Kingsbury has this very solid history of starting hot and then falling off completely the last three years with the Cardinals and plenty of years with the Texas tech before that they'll start the season five and oh, they'll start the season four and two or whatever. And then they'll finish the season. zero and five or finish the season one and five or oh, and four, whatever it is. The Car- Cliff Kingsbury teams always start hot. They're a step ahead of everybody. Everybody adjusts to them, and then they completely fall off because they're not able to make that adjustment to the adjustment. So I, I just wonder if the Bears are the beginning of this stretch for Washington where they need to make an adjustment and they're not able to do so because they got the Bears, the Giants, and the Steelers in the next three games to three fairly decent defenses to great defenses depending on, on the spectrum there. So I, I think the Bears will be able to keep things in front of them with the Washington offense, and then I don't think Washington's defense is all that great. So I, I don't think it's going to be like an easy win or like a blowout or anything right there. But I think it, it's a it's a good stepping stone game for the Bears. And I think they'll get a few touchdowns. They'll hold Washington under 20. They'll score over 20. And, you know, it'll be another one of these like, you know, 24-20 or 21-17 or something along those lines where the Bears win. They, they handle their business, but it's not like a super, super easy game, but they kind of send a little message here of like, Hey, you guys, you guys aren't so tough or so special just yet. I love the analysis. I, like it, I, I agree. I agree pretty much wholeheartedly. So I'm, I'm with you there. Like 27, 21, 24, 27 or something. Yeah. I, I have to agree as well. So man, that's why we love to have you on. So thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for everybody in chat that has been participating and watching. And uh, yeah, this next we cannot get here fast enough. So, um, yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night and bear down. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you, Lord. And once again, everybody, Locked On Bears. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out for sure. Yep.